Okay, welcome back. Um, my name is Karin Siegloch. I'm from the University of Oxford, so I'll be the session chair for this session, and we're returning to the vexed issue of subduction. So this is the subduction session, and it's kicked off by Mike Kendall from the University of Bristol. Okay, thanks, Karin. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, listening to yesterday's talks, I remembered that I was actually at the 25th anniversary when I was uh, just finishing my PhD, which was uh, uh, held in Montreal at the Spring AGU meeting. And uh, I, was, I remember uh, Jason Morgan showing some of the reviews in his early papers and uh, how caustic they were. So uh, I'm not sure that came across yesterday. It certainly wasn't an easy, often these things aren't not easily accepted. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is looking at uh, what we can learn about subduction zone dynamics, looking at seismic anisotropy, and I'll define what I mean by that in a minute. Uh, but I've, I've put up a, a quote that Don Anderson used in his book, The Theory of the Earth, which I think, you know, and, and obviously he did too, really nicely describes shear wave splitting, which is a technique I'm going to use um, uh, to investigate subdu um, subduction zones. Um, so as a means of an introduction, uh, obviously, uh, uh, subduction zones are a key component in the plate tectonic cycle, over 50,000 kilometers in length. They host over 90% of the world's earthquakes, therefore uh, uh, natural hazards are a key issue in, in such environments, and also uh, by the fact that they're building uh, arcs and, and places to live um, of, of human interest. Also, the sites of flux of material and heat in and out of the mantle and also very key in, in the emplacement of, of uh, valuable resources like porphyry metals, for example. But there's still really many outstanding questions associated with subduction. So for example, how does subduction initiate? Uh, why and how do arcs migrate in different settings? There's a, a real diverse variety in the types and styles of, uh, of magmatism at arcs and above subduction regions and what controls that. Um, this, this diagram, I, I, uh, included here is from Wikipedia, and it sort of illustrates, well, A, the danger of using a diagram from Wikipedia. <laughs> but uh, um, we've got a uh, downgoing uh, lithosphere here, which is presumably something like 80 to 100 kilometers thick going into the mantle. Uh, and then we've got the overriding uh, plate. But actually what's marked here is just where the moho is, and there's no discussion really of the lithosphere in this area. And I think this is sort of a, a key question is, you know, um, what role does the thickness of the crust play in, in subduction, and, you know, is there a, a lithosphere, and what, what is its uh, influence? Um, this crustal thickness is important if you consider, for example, Mariana, where the crust is uh, 14, 15 kilometers thick versus, uh, you know, uh, parts of Chile where it's, it's up 60, 70 kilometers thick. And central to all this is really how coupled is, is the mantle to the plates in, in, in a subduction environment. Um, and so I'm going to use uh, looking at seismic anisotropy. Um, seismic tomography in the last 20 years has really, I think, revolutionized the way we look at, at subduction. We're now very comfortable with the idea of slabs extending well into the mantle and often getting right to the core mantle boundary. But there's other areas where you know, these blue subduction zones get hung up at the 660 kilometer discontinuity. So there's a real range of styles. This is a, very much a static picture of what, where the slabs are, where the, the high velocity anomalies are now. Uh, but by looking at seismic anisotropy, we're looking at effectively the deformation history of the mantle and the plates involved. So we can consider you know, the effects, for example, of uh, a, a long strike flow behind a, a retreating or a, um, a, a, a slab rollback situation. And we can look at the effects of melt and, and, and um, other, uh, other, other processes in the upper mantle wedge. So what is seismic anisotropy? So conventionally, as a seismologist refers to, thinks of the Earth as being isotropic. Um, so that means there's no directional variation in seismic velocities in a homogeneous medium. You have a single P wave and a single shear wave. Um, and anisotropy, though, actually is the norm from a theoretical point of view. If you consider the stress-strain relationship, the elastic tensor that relates the stress and strain has 21 independent elastic constants. Uh, and that actually makes wave propagation a lot more complicated. It leads to a directional variation in seismic wave speeds. And not only is there a single P wave that's varying with direction, there's also two shear waves. And this is this idea of shear wave splitting. We often simplify that because we can't really invert for 21 elastic constants. And a common assumption is that we have a hexagonal symmetry and we have five independent elastic constants. And the limit of this is the isotropic case, where we have this directional invariance or complete symmetry in the medium. 
And this is an example of, just as this is for Bridgman, I, I should have put up olivine, but you can see the propagation of the two shear waves and the <coughs> variation in seismic wave speed with direction. So seismic anisotropy, even though it's, it, it's still sort of, uh, you know, not normally considered by seismologists, it has played a, a role in the early acceptance of plate tectonics. So we saw this picture yesterday of Hess, and in his uh, paper in 1964, he looked at compilations of uh, uh, refraction experiments in, in ocean basins, specifically looking at PN phases that travel just below the MOHO, and uh, he noticed that this is very clear azimuthal variation in, in the velocity. So this is the deviation from average of the P wave velocity as a function of azimuth. And so you can see there's a variation of plus or minus 0.4 kilometers a second. And what he noticed is the fastest velocities were oriented in the direction of, of uh, perpendicular to the, to the ridge, and this led to this idea that uh, the olivine and the peridotite, mantle peridotites would align uh, in the direction of plate spreading. And this was an important paper, obviously, in the acceptance of the idea of plate tectonics. About a year later, Bacchus um, theoretically showed, uh, derived a, a, a description for the P wave velocity as a function of azimuth in terms of uh, um, a cosine of 2 theta and fourth, uh, 2 phi and 4 phi terms, where phi is the azimuth. And this went on later to be used by Smith and Dahlin in formulating inversions for anisotropy using surface waves. Um, uh, surface waves, also a very good way of looking at anisotropy. One of the obvious things is the so-called Love-Rayleigh wave discrepancy, the fact that you get different velocities from a Love wave and a, and, and a Rayleigh wave, and Don Anderson showed this when he was working for the Air Force, looking at wave propagation in ice in Greenland, if I remember correctly. Uh, but then later, Schlue and Knopoff also uh, used this idea to map uh, 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 depth variations in the anisotropy and argued at the time that there's a lined melt near what we nowadays call the LAB in the, in the underlying asthenosphere. And this is an idea that's coming back into favor, actually. Again, in a, in a seminal paper, Don Forsyth looked at azimuthal variations in surface waves. He noted that um, uh, the depth variations, uh, that, that the anisotropy was strong down to about 100 kilometers in depth. And he also, like Hess, noticed that there was a directional variation in the, uh, the velocities of the Love and, and Rayleigh waves, and he could even relate this to changes in plate motion in, in, in the Pacific. And then what I'm going to talk about is, is shear wave splitting. And this, this, in some ways, is our most unambiguous indicator of wave propagation in anisotropic media, and the fact that there's two shear waves. If you have a, an incident shear wave in an isotropic medium, it impinges on an anisotropic medium, and it splits into two independent waves. And we can measure the polarization of the leading shear wave. That tells us something about the symmetry of the, the anisotropy. And we can measure the time delay between the fast and the slow shear wave. And that tells us something about the magnitude or the path extent. And this elliptical particle motion in the shear waves is a very telltale sign of this, this so-called shear wave splitting. And one of the first people to really point this out was Stuart Crampton in, in a paper in 1977. And what he's shown here are synthetics for a P wave that's incident on an anisotropic model. It's got an azimuthally varying uh, anisotropy. Um, and if, 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 if that upper layer was isotropic, you'd have a simple P wave arrival, and then you get a P to S conversion at, the, at that interface, which is what would be seen here on the vertical. And you'd also see it on the radial component. But you, because the PSV system is coupled, you see that. But the SH system isn't in the isotropic case. And so you should not see any energy on the transverse component. And in the, in the anisotropic case, what he showed is that you get this clear transverse signal as long as you're away from the symmetry axis of the anisotropy. And you can even see that the one signal looks like the time derivative of the other. And this is, in fact, what Silver and Chad and Vinick and Ando before that in Japan pointed out and exploited in, in these types of studies. So um, I realized in putting this together, this talk together, actually this, this, this paper by Dan actually had a profound influence on my career because my, my PhD supervisor studied at Cambridge. And uh, this line here in this paper looking at finite deformation says, the observed seismic anisotropy in the oceanic lithosphere can be produced by, the fi by finite deformation beneath ridge axes. The same mechanism should give rise to strong anisotropy in the mantle above sinking slabs. Such anisotropy is yet to be detected, perhaps because the observed high velocities have been attributed to thermal effects. And what he shows in this paper is the, the finite strain ellipse. The finite strain is very high in the upper mantle wedge and much, much uh, 
much less in the underlying mantle below the slab. And so my PhD basically was to try and understand how waves propagate in anisotropic media. And it took me about 10 years before I actually started to look at some real data from a subduction zone. So, um, so thanks, Dan, for that. <laughs> um, um, but fortunately, uh, this idea of using shear wave splitting in subduction zones is really ideally suited um, because we have a, a number of different seismic phases we can look at. For example, we can, we can look at crustal earthquakes to get an idea of what's happening to the state of stress in the overriding crust. We can look at uh, um, slab events down in this area to image uh, any finite strain or deformation in the upper mantle wedge. We can look at deeper events to probe the transition zone. We can use events in the slab that go off to teleseismic distances in so-called source side splitting to probe what's in the slab and below. And then finally, we can use these core phases like SKS which imaged the anisotropy in the entire region. And actually, sort of the forefront of this right now is trying to combine all these types of phases into a, a shear wave splitting type uh, tomography. So this, uh, so people obviously, uh, when, when enough data was acquired in the right environments, went to look for these effects. Um, uh, and, and first of all, just what would be predicted? Well, based on uh, the work of, of Dan and, and later Neil Reby, looking at these finite strain ellipses in the upper mantle wedge, um, these are based on 2D models. They predict a, a, a toroidal uh, particle motion. And this is a map view looking down on a subducting slab, and it would predict that the uh, uh, orientation of the fast shear wave should be perpendicular to the, to the, the, the uh, slab trench uh, subduction. Uh, and that the anisotropy would be higher in the upper mantle wedge. And one of the first papers to really look at this, and apologies, this isn't the clearest, uh, clearest plots. These are directly from the science paper. This is from Ray Russo and Paul Silver. They looked at shear wave splitting from slab events and SKS events recorded in South America. And what they found was very little evidence for uh, um, shear wave splitting in the events that are on the top surface of the slab, implying that there's a very weakly anisotropic upper mantle wedge. And also, when they looked at the SKS phases, there was very strong anisotropy, implying anisotropy in the slab or below. And this is aligned in a trench parallel sense. And these, these vectors you can't see very well, but are mostly trench parallel, OK? So what this said very early on is this is clearly a very three-dimensional problem. It's not, not simply just a two-dimensional problem. Uh, this is some more recent work that we've done in Colombia, a dense network of stations across uh, uh, Colombia and into Venezuela. Um, I'll just draw your eye to this. The magenta, this is the delay time, the amount of shear wave splitting just as a function of station number. And these are for all the slab events. And these are down to depths of 200 kilometers. And the amount of anisotropy is tiny. It's on average about 0.3 seconds. And that's what you get in, in, in the crust in this area. Uh, um, the SKS splitting, which is sensitive to the slab and below, is showing much higher amounts of anisotropy. And if you look carefully at this diagram in places, it's trench parallel, then it goes to trench perpendicular, and underneath the whole cordillera, in fact, it actually swings around to follow the trend of the cordillera. And so what this implies is that down going slab, we have a lot of uh, deformation of flow below that. Tears in the slab are having an influence in what we're seeing in terms of the anisotropy. And we have a channel for mantle flow that extends all the way up across Venezuela and up to the Lesser Antilles. And that's what I'll, I'll show you here. So th these are our results that we've recently published for the Lesser Antilles, looking at stations all on all the islands across the Lesser Antilles arc. Again, these are, this is the shear wave splitting in events from a depth of about 50 down to almost 200 kilometers. There's no depth uh, variation at all. And in fact, uh, the average anisotropy in this case is, is, is just over 0.2 seconds. And by looking at crustal events in Montserrat, that's what we get is 0.2 seconds. So I would argue the upper mantle wedge in the Antilles is actually isotropic. SKS splitting is very large. It, it, on average, it's about 1.4 seconds, but it varies quite a bit. And here's a plot of the orientation of the SKS. And for the most part, it's conformal to the uh, trend of the arc. And the place where it isn't is interesting is right in this area here where it goes perpendicular. And this is right the exact spot where Alvarez proposed that there was an outflow of mantle material through the slab um, uh, to accommodate space arguments from the contraction of the Pacific. And it's also the proposed intersection of the North American and, and South American plate boundary. 
So potentially this is telling us something about the dynamics across this area. Then I'm just going to show you very quickly looking at New Zealand through Kermadec up to Tonga. So in New Zealand, again, um, uh, very small amounts of splitting, not showing really obvious depth dependency. The orientation of the splitting is, is essentially trench uh, uh, parallel through here. It swings around in the Taupo volcanic zone to be more perpendicular in this area, but very, very small amounts. If in contrast we go up to uh, the Tonga Kermadec region, though, we get very, very large amounts of splitting, like up to one and a half seconds. Uh, and these are the events that you can use, and you can go well out away from the subduction region uh, to Fiji, and then across towards the Lao back arc spreading center. So large amounts of anisotropy, where if we think of a, 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 a prototype type model, we're sampling different parts of this model, but uh, which can explain some of the variations in magnitude. But the, probably the most interesting observation is that the orientation goes from being trench perpendicular and then very abruptly swings around to becoming trench parallel in this region. So we've got very different setting than what we've had in the other examples I've shown you. We've got a lot of anisotropy in the mantle wedge. Um, and so how do we explain this rotation? So one idea is that we have a long strike flow. This has been argued based on geochemical arguments uh, um, in the past associated with the plume to the north. Um, we could have organized convection in, in the mantle wedge that's aligning uh, antigorite rich serpentinite uh, uh, minerals. Um, this has been proposed by Fichenda both in the slab and more recently work we've done with uh, uh, folks at University of Nagoya. Or it could be associated with, with melt alignment. But the, the bottom line is it's very clearly very different than what's going on much further south in the subduction zone. And so in a really nice paper, Maureen Long and Worth um, looked at all of the upper mantle wedge anisotropy and, and looked, basically noticed that we have anything from 0.1 second, which would say that the wedge is isotropic, up to <coughs> one and a half seconds. And they looked at very, you know, whether there's a, a, a sensitivity or a dependence on slab angle, the age of the plate, the thermal history. And the conclusion was that it's likely that there's contribution from many mechanisms at play and possibly also from B-type olivine and a spentonite <coughs> factor. So that sort of says in general that it's complicated and, and you know, it's going to be hard to make much more progress with it. So we stepped back and then just started to look at these, uh, I, I guess, from a much more simple point of view. This is the magnitude of the splitting in slab phases in the upper mantle wedge, and these are different subduction zones. <coughs> and so here we've got very small amounts, Java, North Japan, up to the very large amounts, Tonga, Izubon in that area. And actually, if you look at these carefully, these ones with very small amounts of splitting are ocean-continent collisions, and these ones are more ocean-ocean. And the one that's maybe controversial is the Lesser Antilles, but I'll later argue that I think that is ocean-continent, is not ocean-ocean. Um, and so that, uh, that begs the question then, is there a correlation with crustal thickness? So here what I've plotted is, and this is difficult because the crustal thickness varies a lot across an arc, and the measurements we have of the anisotropy are very coarse. Um, but, you know, putting error bars on this, there's very clearly a divide. When we've got thin crust, we get very small, we get very large amounts of splitting, and when the crust gets thicker and thicker, we get less. And about 25 kilometers seems to be the uh, um, magic number in this, this transition. The other thing we can do is, is, well, try and work out how much real estate we have in the upper mantle wedge, so we can measure the distance from the moho down to the top of the... Uh, um, uh, the slab where, where the arc's produced, so we, we use depth estimates from, from England at all. Crustal thickness, uh, probably could use, you know, uh, update this, but um, earlier papers. And then finally, what's work in progress is trying to then think about, well, it's not just a crust, there might be some lithosphere in this area, and is heat flow a proxy for that? Uh, and when we do that calculation, we get this, 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 this uh, Z, uh, D minus Z, which I've miswritten here, so this is the opposite. Um, there's the delay time and that, that area between, and you can see basically nothing lies below this line here. There is a lot of variability though in this area, especially in the continent ones, which may be suggesting that there's some lithosphere left in some places and not others. So I'm just gonna focus on some of the more interesting ones. Chile, where we've got very, very thick crust, very small amount of splitting, lesser Antilles, where we have thick crust, um, but there's a lot of room, so we'd expect slightly more. And then Mariana, which is the thinnest crust, 
but, but and we get reasonable amount of splitting, but not not as much as some of the other other ocean-ocean uh, -ocean collisions. Uh, as I said, um, I was trying. This is sort of work in progress. Uh, I didn't really finish last night, but looking at Zelmer's uh, 2008 paper, looking at heat flow and uh, um, dome production, basically an argument that the, the more volcanoes you have. Uh, the less viscous the, the melt is, and is there a correlation with heat flow? And there does seem to be an inverse correlation. But then is there a correlation with average crustal thickness? And it's, it's not really clear. Some of our larger areas are up in this area, which would imply lower heat flow, so maybe more insulation. But, but I, to be honest, I need to look at that a bit more carefully. So as I said, the Izubon and Mariana is, is interesting. Here we've got a, a long trend where the angle of subduction goes from the steepest of anywhere on the Earth to about 45 degrees. And the amount of anisotropy goes from modest to a lot. Uh, and the crustal thickness in this area is very, very thin. So Mariana is perhaps you know, a bit of an exception. I think the argument here is really simple. Because it's such a steep slab, the olivine fabric is aligned sub-horizontally coming in and then sub-vertically coming down. <coughs> Whereas when the slab is more like 45 degrees, uh, and you're looking at events down here, you're going to see much more uh, shear wave splitting. Uh, you're going to see the effects of the anisotropy more. So I'm appealing to a purely geometrical explanation for why Mariana isn't as large as we'd expect. Um, <clears throat> so in these areas where we have high amounts of, of anisotropy, what's causing this? So, so perhaps an easy explanation is we've just got 3D flow. Um, uh, Julian Lohman and others, Peter and others in papers have shown that if you have three-dimensional structure, you can entrain a long strike flow um, uh, towards the colder areas. Uh, we may have a contribution of B-type olivine, but only in the very cold upper nose here, and a lot of the data I've shown is actually sampling back more in this area. Or we may have simple 2D convection, uh, but actually we're looking at the alignment of uh, an antigrite-rich serpentinite uh, <coughs> domain in this area, and this is, is uh, being proposed, for example, for uh, explaining the anisotropy in Ryukyu. Um, in the areas that it's poorly, you know, in, in, in the continent uh, ocean collisions where we have very poorly developed convection, I mean, there's, a, there's an issue that by not seeing any anisotropy implying that there's no convection in there, it, it makes it difficult to get fertile, you know, what's the mechanism for getting fertile mantle in to produce the arc volcanism. So as I said, in the Antilles, we have much thicker crust than we originally thought, and it actually gets thicker as you go towards the north. Here's an undulating moho derived from a, 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 a modeling of, of uh, receiver functions. Uh, and what I'll point out here is that the actual arc in the Antilles has migrated um, uh, westward in this case. And perhaps as the, um, you know, this is speculation at this stage, as the convection in the wedge is starting to, to, to choke off, the wedge starts to migrate. And this might be really more acute in uh, central Chile, where we've got a very, very thick crust the Altapuna um, uh, Plateau, we're getting you know, up 70 kilometers thick. Very little room between the slab and the, and the crust. And the uh, arc has migrated uh, systematically eastward uh, with something referred to as tectonic erosion. And perhaps this, 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 you know, the anisotropy is the telltale sign of um, the lack of convection in this area. So to conclude, I think anisotropy has revealed a, a much more complicated <coughs> behavior, dynamic behavior in subduction regions than we originally anticipated, and it's actually an inherently 3D problem. Subslab anisotropy reveals a long strike flow and, and a degree of coupling between the slab and the mantle, especially in, in, in rollback settings. But I would add, that what I haven't talked about, is that we cannot neglect the effects of the slab itself and the entrained asthenosphere, and, and Alex Son and uh, Hitoshi Kawakatsu pointed that out a few years ago also. Um, I think we're now at an exciting stage. We've got lots of data from subduction regions. We've got good ocean bottom uh, seismic deployments, for example, in the Voila experiment in the Caribbean. Uh, we can start using new anisotropic tomography methods to better isolate the different domains. Um, I would argue there's a clear variation in the anisotropy in the upper mantle wedge between the ocean-ocean settings, which are clearly anisotropic, and the ocean continent. And I think the, the simplest model is that they are, this region is isotropic suggests, you know, differences in style of, you know, related to differences in style of arc um, volcanism. And the implications for arc migration are with ocean-ocean, the Mariana arc is moving, but it's moving in the opposite direction, and that's simply a rollback effect. 
whereas in the ocean continent setting, perhaps this stagnation is, and lack of influx of fertile material is causing the arc to move forward. But we have to be careful about that statement and, and go back and do the mass balance calculations properly. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks very much. We have plenty of time for questions. Dan. Dan McKenzie. The thing that's always worried me about uh, such enterprises is whether actually the anisotropy is due to lattice preferred orientation mm -hmm. or due to the fact that the, you're in a region with an extremely steep temperature gradient, which will produce a, an apparent anisotropy uh, of exactly the sort that you're talking about, which is one which is related to the sinking slab, because you've got essentially, you know, as well as the two sorts of anisotropy you talked about from the present flow, you've got an anisotropy in the sinking slab as well, yes, yeah. inherited <clears throat> from how it was produced. But you've also got this very steep gradient, which will look like a, a, a lattice preferred orientation, but isn't. Mm. How does a steep gradient uh, uh, give you a, 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 um, a apparent anisotropy? Oh, I mean, just you, simply that the, 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 if, the, if the waves are polarized, I mean, anything which breaks the symmetry will do mm -hmm. it, right? So the polarization of, of waves which are parallel to mm -hmm. the, the, the temperature gradient is different from those which are at Be, right Because end. of the finite frequency effects, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 no, I mean, that's a good but point. You, you, you generally are working, I don't know, didn't say much about the frequency band you're working, but most of this work on, on S-wave splitting is done at, at periods of five to 10 seconds rather than, than the very the, high frequency. The SKS ones are dominantly about eight seconds, but the, uh, the, the um, slab events are more like two, one, two, up to five hertz, so much higher frequency. But um, I think you'd have a really hard time explaining one and a half seconds of, of splitting in Tonga with, with the, the mechanism you described. I do agree, though, that there is a... Uh, a Have you done the sums? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not it's hard. Not there's, obvious. There's, not, there's not enough room to, to you know, it, over the, the, the length scale of that, that gradation. One and a half seconds, if you have 5% anisotropy, implies a 150-kilometer thick uh, region. So you could drive the anisotropy up to 20% and get it down to 50, but even then, that's, you know, that, that, we don't see that magnitude of anisotropy anywhere. Um, so I, I don't think there's enough to explain it based on that argument. I do agree, though, there is a, 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 an argument of LPO versus things like melt alignment. And, uh, and then even with LPO, is it olivine LPO or is it other phases? Like, like You've got 100 kilometers of slab in which to do this, and you're coming up it bleakly. I don't think 150 kilometers is at all problematic. No, the events are on the top side of the slab. So you're not even no, seeing no, no, I'm, the slab. I'm talking about, uh, the SKS splitting, it's the, which is it, the big one, right? Well, no, it, the, the slab events in all the ocean, ocean ones are large, right? Tonga, Izubonu, oh, Aleutians. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> Saw something back there. Uh, Cindy Eppinger, I, and uh, subduction zone uh, SKS splitting neophyte, but I'm, uh, you know, wondering um, about the the nulls, and, and particularly in the ocean continent subduction zone. Is there a pattern, and is there information that it helps understand the complex layering in these areas? Um, <clears throat> for the the events that are on the top side of the slab, it, the answer is no. It's very complicated because I think it really is just reflecting the crustal stresses. So if you look at the, the crustal anisotropy in the Puna Plateau, it's, it, 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 it follows the big fault trends and it varies quite dramatically. In the um, SKS, there are nulls um, at the uh, central point by the bend in the Nazca slab. And that potentially is saying that there's a deviation in the long strike flow at that point. Um, but yeah, the null, the, it is a good point. The nulls normally are not considered and yet they hold valuable information. So have observations been made at the edges of arcs? And that's 
probably an even more complicated situation, but maybe it could also resolve some ambiguity. You mean at the edges where? Where the arc segments end and maybe transitions into a new arc segment. What does the <coughs> anisotropy look like there? Yeah, well, in, in some ways, I guess New Zealand's a good setting of that because you go from arc to transform faults. That, yeah, and there it, 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 it really swings around to follow the direction of the transform fault. But I'm not sure whether that's helping us understand what's going on in the subduction zone so much. Okay, thanks very much. The next presentation is given by Saskia Goes from Imperial College. Thank you. So I'm going to take you a bit deeper into the mantle, still looking at subduction zones. And I'm going to talk about recent work we've been doing and a review we've been doing on subduction transition zone interaction. And a lot of the work has been done by Roberto Agrusta um, in collaboration with Jeroen van Hunen. And I'm also going to present some of Fanny Carrel's uh, results. So it's been long, known for a very long time that slabs seem to encounter some resistance as they sink deeper into the mantle. Um, this is a picture from Isaac and Molnar and the open circles in the slab were from focal mechanisms and they're filled where they're in down dip tension and they're open where they're in down dip compression. So they noted that most deep slabs in deep in the transition zone seem to be in compression, so they probably encounter some strength, uh, some increase in strength as they go down into the mantle. As the data improved and the imaging techniques improved, um, it, it was found that slabs interact in many different ways with the transition zone. So this is a compilation we made based on a whole lot of different uh, body wave tomographic studies. Um, the horizontal lines here represent the base of the transition zone at about 660. And then the different blue shapes are different shapes of the slabs as they've been imaged by tomography. And you can see some slabs seem to pierce straight through. So the most famous one is the Farallon slab below Central America. That seems to go straight into the lower mantle. There are a few others. The Hellenic slab that was discussed yesterday seems to go down to about 1,400 kilometers. Um, under Kamchatka, the slab seems to go straight down. But a lot of other slabs are deformed. So the flat slabs in the Western Pacific are very famous, of course, under Izu, also under Honshu. Um, also, the Tonga slaps, flattens for a while and then seems to go into the lower mantle. Uh, whether it's connected or not, uh, different tomographers will debate about that. Um, and then many of the slaps that do go into the lower mantle seem to thicken. So there's quite a bit of deformation going on. There are two unusual slaps. One is below India, below the Himalayas. There seems to be a rollover slap along a specific cross-section. Not all of the slaps seems to do that. And then uh, there's been a lot of debate recently about whether there's any resistance at 1,000 kilometers based on plumes that seem to change their shapes at that depth, and other people have looked at slabs. But really, if you look at all the different uh, tomography, there's one convincing flat slab below the transition zone, and that's under Borneo. And even there, some people would say that's not actually connected to the upper mantle slab. Um, but nowhere else is it really very obvious that you need a flat slab below the 660. So from this tomography, you can estimate the length of the, um, of the slab. So there's up to about 500 to 2,000 kilometers of stagnant slabs where they're lying flat in the transition zone. And they thicken by a factor two to four where people have tried to correct for their resolution. So this has brought up two long-standing questions. One is what causes all this diversity? Um, and the second is, what's the effect of this in terms of how the upper and the lower mantle communicate with each other and um, mix in terms of heat and mass? And does that, has that changed through time? So I'm going to touch on both of those questions uh, to some extent. Um, these are the mechanisms that have been proposed for the resistance that the slabs seem to encounter. So one is obviously the increase in viscosity with depth. That's what post-glacial rebound data um, require, they require at least that the lower mantle is probably more viscous than the upper mantle. Where that increase occurs, that's not well constrained, but the phase transitions are a logical place to get an increase in viscosity. Um, then um, the phase transition at the base of the transition zone, the main phase transition from the olivine system into the, the uh, perovskite system is an endothermic one under the conditions that would prevail here in the mantle. 
And that means that um, the transition happens deeper in the slab than outside of the slab, and it makes the slab relatively buoyant at that depth, uh, making it more difficult for it to sink through. Some people have proposed some chemical layering, so density not just due to the phase transition, but some kind of chemistry. I'm not going to talk about that further because most people who've tried that, that seems to completely layer the mantle <coughs> at that chemical interface. Um, and then the other thing to think about is not just resistance from the surrounding mantle, but actually the properties of the slab itself. So the strength of the slab near the trench and the density of the slab control um, the trench retreat. So this is something that Mike asked, what controls the migration of the arc or the trench retreat, um, and that those intrinsic properties of the slab play a big role there. Um, the other thing that has been proposed is that the slab strength in the transition zone may play a role. So, for example, the phase transitions may make the slab locally weaker there, and that would allow it to bend more easily and maybe flatten in the transition zone. Um, models that people have made that do that, that doesn't actually seem to be a very primary factor that allows the slap to, slaps to flatten. So again, I'm not going to discuss that further. So I'm just showing you some um, models. These are models from uh, Bohunkova and Siskova in 2008, and they made some nice thermomechanical models for the slaps are thermal. They have quite complicated rheologies with dislocation, diffusion creep. They allow some yielding. They have a weak zone between the two plates. Um, and they allow the plate velocities to be governed by the, the density distribution in the model, basically. What they don't allow is for the trench to move. So when they do that, and they, these are three different models um, with um, different viscosity jumps at the base of the upper mantle. Um, so no viscosity jump, factor 10, and a factor 30. And you can see that all of these slaps go through. In, they go straight into the lower mantle, they slow down if the viscosity of the lower mantle increases. They deform more, they thicken more, but they all go through. They do similar models with a, face, a bunch of phase transitions and earlier work, which Christensen and Yuan did. So they have a slap here going down that's stagnated at the 660 um, because they put a very strong phase transition with a Clapeyron slope of minus 4 to minus 6 megapascal per Kelvin. That can clearly layer the convection completely. What Bohunkova and Siskova found is that with these stronger slabs and much milder um, Clapeyron slopes of minus two and a half, which is sort of the maximum that most people from the mineral physics community would put on that transition at the moment, um, the slabs pierce straight through. Um, if they add a, a 410 discontinuity, an exothermic one, so one where the slab is, has an increased density, that speeds up the slaps through it and leads to more deformation and buckling. But again, this phase transition doesn't seem to be very efficient at keeping some slaps in the upper mantle and having others go straight through. <coughs> so then the effect of trench retreat. Um, already early models, these are laboratory models, um, where they modeled a down-going plate, which was free to move. The trench was also free to move, but the plate couldn't sink deeper than the base of their box, basically. So if there's a resistance to that, spontaneously you get to trench retreat. That's an easy way for subduction to happen. Um, the slap just falls vertically, basically, into the mantle and the trench retreats. Um, when Christensen, he made some mo different models where he actually prescribed the amount of trench retreat, so this doesn't happen spontaneously, and he finds more trench retreat gives you a longer flat slap, so that makes sense. But what we need to understand then is what actually governs the amount of trench retreat you might get. And this is a summary figure from many different studies that ran mechanical and thermomechanical models, which allowed the trench to move spontaneously, so freely, no constraints by the upper plate, basically. And what these studies find is that the amount of trench retreat is governed by the density of the downgoing plate, so the amount of slab pool, and the strength at the trench, so the resistance of the plate to bend, because it has to bend to go into the trench. So if you have a low density, then the slaps sink slowly. They basically have more time to bend, so they could achieve a steeper dip. If they also have a low bending strength, then you get very steep slaps, and you get these slaps that just go straight down, and they may buckle a bit as they reach uh, resistance at the base of the upper mantle. If this, there's a high slap pool, the slaps don't have that much time to bend, and um, <coughs> also if they have a high bending strength, they tend to bend much less, they dip at much, much less, 
and they retreat a lot more, they'll also um, subduct a lot faster. So that's the kind of patterns you predict. You can get other shapes, for example, this rolled over shape you can get if you have a slap with a low density but a high strength. So potentially if you have a slap with a bit of consonant or stretch consonant on top like in the Himalayas, you could get that kind of shape. So if we now start to put it together a bit, so here are models, these are thermomechanical models, they're funny made, um, where the trench is free to move, um, and there is a viscosity jump at the base of the upper mantle. So the, the, the grey box is the lower mantle with a high viscosity, there's a jump of a factor 30, she has also complex rheologies um, in there, and she varies the age of the downgoing plate. So you have young plates, which are both low density and low strength, and old plates, which are high density and high strength, and she gets this kind of uh, difference in morphology. She also varies the age of the upper plate, so the thickness of the upper plate, and that puts some additional constraints on how much the trench can move. So with this variation in downgoing plate age, and we know this exists on Earth, the age the plates go down with different ages at subduction zones, you can get a whole range of slab morphologies. What you don't get in these models is that the slabs are actually stagnant. So the slab flattens a bit here, but it actually still sinks at one centimeter a year. So it doesn't actually stagnate. You can't make a 2,000 kilometer long flat slab um, in this way. For that, you additionally need the phase transition. So we also add an endothermic phase transition here, and on the models from Roberto. Here's an example with a factor 10 jump in uh, viscosity and a phase transition uh, Clapeyron slope of minus two. The young slaps go straight through. The old slaps flatten out and make now a long, flat slap. And he tried a whole range of, uh, of um, face, face boundary parameters of Clapeyron slopes and a range of jumps between the upper and the lower mantle. And you can see in this gray area, you get young slaps penetrating, old slaps um, flattening out. When you're down here, so if you have very little resistance from the face boundary, you, all the slaps go through. If you have very little resistance from a viscosity jump, also all slaps go through. You really need both of them to get um, these different modes. So this seems to at least form a, a fit the major, the first order kind of observation. Most of the flat slaps we see are in the Western Pacific, where we know there's very old plate going down. And uh, most of the um, penetrating slabs are in the, in the Eastern Pacific, where we have younger plate going down. So that, at least that first order picture fits with um, these kind of models. Yes, thank you. So um, what that, uh, there, there's variability in this, of course. There's complexity also compared to these models. The upper plate has an effect. Lateral variations in buoyancy may have an effect. Um, but. What this has shown is basically that you really, it's not an either or, it's all these different things. You need an increase in viscosity, you need the endothermic phase transition, and you very much need strong plates with mobile trenches to get the diversity um, that we see. So finally, briefly some words on um, the time scales. So when these flat slabs have been compared with reconstructions, plate reconstructions, people estimate the ages of it, and most of these don't seem to have been there much longer than 22, at most 60 million years. So these are all Cenozoic slabs, and it appears, again, from comparison with plate reconstructions, that the Mesozoic slabs are mostly in the lower mantle. So that's sort of the time scale of the efficiency of mixing that this process seems to give today. And then finally, um, what Roberto did is he cranked up the temperatures in his model to see what would happen in an earlier Earth. So if we make the Earth hotter now, so these are just all slaps, two times uh, snapshots, what you can see that as you make the Earth hotter, the plates become thinner, the trenches migrate less, and all of them go, go through. So that's the summary of his results. He changed um, the temperature, so increasing temperatures, increasing belly number, this is increasing resistance from the phase transition. In uh, today's temperatures, you can get a mixed mode of stagnant and penetrating slabs. Um, if you increase the temperatures, all of them go through. If you would decrease the temperatures, you could, with high base buoyancy resistance, get all of them to stagnate. And this contrasts with a lot of previous work where people have made 
a mode diagram more like this, where they say if you increase the temperature, the slabs become more and more stagnant. And what we find is that if we make the plates very weak, then actually the first ones that are going to stagnate are the young plates. You can get young plates eventually to stagnate, and the old ones are still going through, um, and there's mixed melt, but that's a different one than we see on Earth. So that's what a, the regime that a lot of other models have been in without strong slabs. So that's the last slide. Um, so just to summarize, I think we have some time scale of sort of the um, efficiency of mixing today, mainly from the observations. And if we go back in time, we would actually expect that the Earth would have mixed better rather than less well, as many previous studies said. Thank you. We have time for one quick question. If there's back in the early 90s, I think it was. Um, sorry, back in the early 90s, Dars, Pegler, and Woodhouse suggested that the slab beneath in, beneath New Guinea thickened. They saw it, thought they saw it thickening as they went down, and also saw um, what they thought were sets of conjugate normal faults, which suggest down dip compression that would account for that thickening. Is that something you've seen elsewhere? So they see that clearly in Marianas as well, I think. When people have mapped really the focal mechanisms in great detail, they can sometimes see alignments of these faults, and they, they, it, it really seems to thicken. Yes. Thank you. Okay, let's move on, because we'll have a bit of discussion time before lunch. Um, the next talk is given by Teru Alex Song, also locally here, from uh, UCL. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, thanks uh, for inviting me to uh, uh, speak uh, today. So uh, what I learned yesterday was that basically uh, two major things. So one is a lot of excitement, and the one is a hard data. So I think today, as a seismologist, so what I'm trying to do is to provide some hard data to uh, test some hypotheses. <coughs> so uh, uh, as you can see, the title of the talk is about the seismic prop of mental mixing, and maybe I will emphasize a bit more about our mixing in the Earth's transition zone. And this is work that I did with my colleague in China, as well as a colleague in uh, UCL. And of course, also contribution from uh, my uh, friends uh, in uh, South Korea. So of course, uh, as uh, actually uh, briefly discussed yesterday, and I'm going to speak uh, and start with the uh, talk by considering some possibility. So as you have learned, many years ago, uh, the contribution from early workers. And of course, mental mixing is still a mystery by, of course, Mackenzie. And of course, what I will consider today is to test this hypothesis using seismology. In particular, consider this marble cake uh, model, where you basically have two major components. One is the depleted lithosphere, and of course, the other uh, is the oceanic crust. So here, I think it's a movie that's supposed to play, but I'm not sure it's actually going to. And, but I think the major thing I want to discuss uh, here by this movie, which is not going to show, is uh, over the past 230 million years, uh, most of the subduction that you can see from here, uh, they actually pretty stagnant in terms of their uh, geographical distribution. So basically, if you look at in the eastern power, you see here, uh, they are pretty much uh, stagnant in terms of uh, no uh, subduction over this domain. <coughs> and a lot of subduction uh, consistently uh, take place uh, in the, the other domain. And uh, I guess the question is whether this type of uh, relatively fixed uh, flows and modulate by play motion will have any input on the mixing or unmixing uh, of the Earth. Okay. So, of course, uh, one of the major things has been discussed before is about the uh, density contract between these two components. As you can see, the density uh, as a function of depth for the Hartzberg guy and also for the morph in green. So, I think one major uh, difference is actually uh, take place over uh, 660 kilometer depths, where, as you can see, the Hartzberg guy actually makes the transition <coughs> a little bit earlier, and uh, rather than the uh, morph, which have the phase transition take place a little bit deeper depth. So, what happened is here, basically form uh, regions where you can actually have the more uh, floated above the 660, but the heart of a guy actually slightly uh, below the 660. In this case, actually form a compositional uh, localized stratification. So here I will basically show an uh, uh, older plot by Ringwood and basically represent some of the uh, processes 
uh, actually envision to take place uh, in the mental transition zone. But I think my major thing that I want to point out is uh, in the hypothesis, uh, the basaltic and hydrogetic components separate on their way down. So everything kind of uh, uh, separately uh, magically uh, on their way down. And here's a more recent analysis by a bomber at all in 2015. As you can see, uh, the same thing actually happened. So but in this case, through a numerical calculation, what they found is uh, on the left, it basically shows uh, the basaltic uh, uh, fraction as a function of depth. As you can see here, there's an increased basaltic fraction uh, up to about 60 or even 70 percent, uh, just right above the transition zone. So on the right, I basically show uh, uh, a slice uh, around the globe. As you can see in red, basically shows the distribution of hydrogetic uh, basaltic component as stagnant uh, in the transition zone. And uh, of course, in this particular, or generally the geodynamic calculations, what happened is the basaltic uh, or hydrogetic component, they separate on their way up. So because the chromium boundary is so hot, then they are actually weak enough to be uh, separated. And then they kind of flow up and stagnant according to their uh, local buoyancy near the 660. And uh, so I would just borrow one slide from uh, Paul Tackley. And of course, as you can see here, a lot of major uh, processes and observations being made about the uh, downwelling slab as well as mega plume. And of course, one major uh, 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 cartoon actually show here is this uh, compositional stratification around 660. So I guess the question is whether we actually see. And if we do see it, when where are they? And of course, what we try to uh, understand through uh, a bunch of uh, uh, possibilities, so including uh, seismic observations. But I want to point out just quickly three different things. So one, of course, as you can see, uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, minerals that, uh, of course, go through the phase transition, either olivine component or basaltic or garnet component. So uh, I guess one of the major thing is, so what's the rheology of the transition zone minerals? So do we know uh, well enough to, uh, to see how they actually separate it uh, if they go uh, on their way down. And of course, another thing is about the pressure of the phase transition. So as you can see, illustrated by Hirose 2001, so here basically shows uh, the pressure against temperature. And of course, you have two different systems. The one is for uh, olivine system, the other one for uh, the garnet system. The major uh, here is that, as you can see, the difference between the solid line and dash line, which is implicated by different use of pressure scale, that represents the difficulty to actually pin down exactly the pressure where the phase transition occurred. But I guess one nice thing is, regardless which uh, pressure scale you use, the difference in pressure of the transition between two components are pretty much fixed. So as you can see, uh, the difference between the two black lines is similar to the two dash lines. And of course, if we can actually define and observe this certification, we can actually help calibrate the transition pressure. And of course, finally, just to show a map of the uh, uh, play configuration through time. And uh, as you can see here, and also I mentioned in the beginning, uh, most of the uh, subduction as you can see happen uh, in the middle of the domain. And of course, near the current the Pacific on, the other, on both sides, and uh, they are pretty much uh, lack of subduction in the past to at least 230 million years. So of course, uh, after all this, so what I'm trying to present is the seismic evidence of uh, hard to guide and basal stratification, and hopefully try to see how they regionally vary and whether they modulate by this uh, path uh, play motion history. And what I'm gonna do is to, of course, provide it uh, seismic observation as a seismologist, and of course, uh, my colleague uh, at UCL they will provide physical parameter predicted by their Hephaestal, which is uh, uh, using uh, self-consistent thermodynamics and uh, discussion. So on the left, of course, as you can see, two components, hard to guide and, and more, and how they change as a function of depth or pressure. Then we're gonna couple these calculations and <coughs> compare against observations. So I, as you can see on the right are two different lines. So one, of course, showing the dashed line, showing the transition of the hard to component. And the solid line shows the uh, transition of the garnet component. And of course, we're gonna discuss the mixing of the two components and focusing on observations uh, centered at the 410 and also centered at the 660. So uh, I have uh, very limited time, so I'm gonna show quickly how we're actually gonna constrain 
and why it's going to be uh, uh, relatively unique. So what I'm going to do is to use all the energy coming from uh, tidal seismic earthquakes and record it uh, beneath the station. And of course, as you can see, a zoom in of this ray pass, uh, two different ray paths is concentrated here. So one is the conversion in blue. So the other one are basically top side reflection. And of course, by using these two uh, different waves, we can actually have a very consistent sampling. And uh, what I really want to uh, untangle is uh, all these parameters, so including the transition width, the velocity jump, density jump, as well as the gradient. And of course, a few things that I can point out is the consistent sampling and the bandwidth, which is relatively broadband. And also, we can determine those parameters in the same time. So I just want to uh, maybe point out to uh, kind of uh, uh, observation I found is if you look at all the literature since the 1967, uh, only two studies constrain these two parameters at the same time. And they are constrained at the long period. And there's no study estimate all these parameters uh, for some reason. OK, just quickly go through the data set. So I have the data uh, in China, which I cover uh, quite a large area of several thousand kilometers next to a segment lab on the right. And here shows all the sampling points we have, mostly uh, in the eastern part of China. And there are some details that I would uh, not really uh, discuss, but mostly uh, focusing on the data quality. And also in this case, as you can see, we have about 100,000 of data that's uh, available in this analysis. So quickly to show uh, the stack as a function of epicentral distance. So each uh, basically trace show one degree beam. And uh, as you can see at the top, each one degree beam uh, include about 2,000 trace. And you can see the P wave at the very top. You can see the conversion from the 410 and 660. Also, you can see the com uh, top side reflection from the 410 and 660. So this is actually going to uh, form the basis of the analysis in terms of the amplitude as a function of frequency. OK, so of course, analyzing amplitude is quite, uh, in some way, tricky. So I wouldn't be able to uh, uh, detail here, but there are five major steps. So basically, we are uh, going to stack the data using their slowness. We'll make some uh, amplitude correction due to incoherent stacking and waveform misalignment. Then we consider differential attenuation. Also, uh, of course, in this case, we consider those the focusing defocusing, in this case, over large wide area. Uh, is relatively minimum. And of course, we have to strap estimate on the uncertainty. So here, just to show our, our estimate at the 410 uh, between the velocity jump and density jump. So some of the uh, reference model, as you can see uh, from Yasti, uh, is basically right here. So I mentioned two uh, studies that constrain both density and velocity contrast. So here is basically the Lorentz and shear globally. And here, basically, it's an estimate from uh, Kato and Kawakatsu, uh, which is actually done in Philippines. <coughs> and uh, here is basically our uh, estimate, which is right here, about the 2% uh, uh, percent density jump, 6% velocity jump. So these two uh, diamonds here show the estimate in the laboratory for terawatt. And as you can see, <coughs> if you increase the basal fraction, uh, it's actually going to go down. And this is actually what uh, our estimate uh, uh, situated uh, in this case. <coughs> So of course, uh, one thing that of course I mentioned in the beginning, how do we actually constrain the uh, compositional stratification? So here on the left, it's to show a very simple model. So in this case, we have a constant basal fraction of 30% and varies the degree of stratification and how that basal fraction decreases across 660. And then as you can see, the velocity profile and the density profile according to each case. And what we show in black here is the AK-135 model. So here is actually the result. For the amplitude of the uh, conversion and the reflection uh, at the 660, how they change as a function of frequency. So if you have actually constant basal fraction, that means there's no stratification. Uh, actually, this is shown in this blue line and also show here. But if you have a large degree of stratification, as shown in uh, a green line or in purple line. So what that means, the data actually suggests there's actually 20% or so a decrease in basal fraction across the 660. So here I basically compile uh, our estimate and other estimate around the globe, in this case using regional uh, high resolution uh, velocity profile around the globe that's available uh, in these references. So I'm going to actually present the, uh, all the data compiled in the velocity contrast and also velocity gradient. Uh, 
what you see here, all this plot is centered at the prediction by Paralyte. You see the observation here in China. All the color here basically shows the basal fraction increase in red. So here, if it goes down, which means you increase in basal fraction. So you can see most of the uh, uh, data, uh, in this case from the Pacific, they are in this domain, so which means they are in blue, which very little basal fraction. And most of the data in Mexico, Philippines, China, and also Australia, and also uh, America, where you actually uh, receive a substantial subduction over the past uh, uh, 200 million years, uh, have a various degree of different uh, basal fraction. On the right, showing the same data set, but actually we're looking at the differences in the stratification. So if you see a red color, so which means there's no differences in basal fraction across the 660, if you see a blue color, which will represent a large stratification. So what happened is, as you can see here, uh, a lot of data that needs area where you have substantial subduction that actually consists with a large degree of stratification. And of course, we are considering maybe this is the one of the reasons that could produce slag stagnant uh, near the 660. So uh, I will just uh, maybe stop here. You can read the conclusion. Thank you. We have time for one quick question, if there's one right now. No? OK. Then you can read the conclusions and ask questions in the discussion. The last talk in the session will be given by Dove van der Meer on the Atlas of the Underworld. Right. So uh, the Atlas of the Underworld uh, is a project we've been working on for uh, the past uh, few years, but in reality it goes back to publications uh, from, from Wim Spakman in particular, going back to the 90s. It's basically a compilation of all the um, imaged slab remnants that we can see in the mantle. Uh, and previously we, we focused on lower mantle, this time we also included uh, a lot of slabs in the transition zone and upper mantle. Um, I'm also glad to say that uh, what I'm showing you today uh, is part of a paper that uh, has been accepted by Tectonic Physics and will appear online. So everything that you see today is uh, very recent, um, with the only exception maybe with the, the, the picture of Vince Pakman, uh, who is definitely more mature these days than the, this picture suggests <laughs> for people that know him. Uh, yeah. Right. So, uh, where did it start? Uh, this initial uh, cataloging of uh, slabs, um, I refer back to our 2010 paper, where uh, we, we cataloged 28 uh, lower mantle slabs uh, and co co checked their uh, interpretation with some slabs that were known for a longer time, for, for example, the Aegean or Hellenic slab, uh, discussed by a number of authors, including women's his earlier work from the 80s and 90s. The Farallon uh, or Cocos slab that uh, was published by Grant and Van der Hilst in, uh, in 1994, 97. And uh, deeper down, as an uh, ultra deep slab, uh, the Mongolochotsk uh, slab uh, described by Rob van der Vaux in 99. So in 2010, we used uh, these slabs and, and 25 uh, other ones uh, to understand can slabs provide us with a, a mental reference framework? something which is independent from, for example, uh, hotspot tracks. And as you know, hotspot tracks run out uh, pretty much after about 100 million years. So further back in time, you don't have that reference framework anyway. So at the time, and this is a polar uh, projection of uh, the, the seismic tomographic model at about 1,900 kilometers depth. You see uh, North America here, Europe here, and Asia there. We see uh, the Fairland slab uh, in this corner here, Mongolokotsk there and the Aegean slab, uh, this blob uh, over here. So the good thing is about this depth is that all these three key well-known slabs uh, are present. And, and if you then use plate tectonic reconstructions, uh, we used the one from uh, Trond Torswick and uh, Bernd Steinberger at the time, uh, we actually noticed a misfit. So the, the Fairland slab uh, was thought to be at least a largely uh, continental margin subduction happening at about that location. The Aegean slab was somewhat uh, misplaced uh, on the southern end of uh, Baltica. And also for Mongolochotsk uh, uh, slab uh, was uh, well, thought to subduct here somewhere in between these uh, Asian blocks. 
uh, whereas the actual slab location was further to the west. So uh, in this way, uh, we could say, well, suppose that uh, we need to rotate the whole plate tectonic reconstruction uh, by about 18 degrees. Uh, can we get a better fit? Uh, yes, we can. And that was the, the reason why we got this paper uh, published. Uh, is it perfect? No, it's not. Uh, did we correct too much or not enough? Uh, that uh, has been a subject of debate for, uh, since 2010 and uh, numerous papers uh, since. Um, but anyway, so the key of this talk is a catalogue of lower mantle slabs uh, and that we've now expanded. So one spin-off of uh, the 2010 study is basically, so how fast do slabs really sink into the mantle? We have obviously plenty of um, uh, mantle modelers uh, who, who experiment with various viscosity ranges. But what does the data suggest? So at the time we, we uh, interpreted the top and the base of all these slabs. Uh, when did they uh, subduct on the base of their, their geological history? And then looking in the, to the tomographic model, what are the tops and bases and applying wide error ranges uh, to those as well. So um, uh, giving an idea of the accuracy of our measurements or at least trying to be a bit humble about these. And what do we see? All this data lines up in this envelope, sort of uh, uh, this gray envelope here. And you see the three uh, key slabs I've discussed before uh, as an example here, uh, which are sort of more or less all sinking at more or less the same speed. So at the time, it was about uh, 12 millimeters per year, plus minus 3 millimeters per year, is sort of the variation you see in the lower mantle. So 2017, we're seven years further. Uh, we've applied the same uh, methodology. So we identified the slabs in uh, our tomographic model uh, and calibrated against uh, the plate tectonic reconstructions and, and in geology. Um, so we also looked at other tomographic models, notably uh, S40 RTS uh, from Jeroen Ritsma and Schaefer and Lepfedev uh, 2013. Uh, to check whether those uh, anomalies that we see, are they also present in, in those models? Uh, and yes, they are. And if they were not, then uh, we, we didn't, uh, well, basically stopped cataloging that one. And we also applied systematic, systematic approach. So we start within the upper mantle, the younger subduction zones, the active subduction zones, uh, which we can correlate to, uh, correlate to the shallower slabs. And then we go deeper and deeper. So key to understand is that the timing of subduction, we get it from the geological literature. And uh, all in all, it is about uh, 600 uh, papers that we've uh, gone through to understand when was vulcanism, arc vulcanism uh, happening. So we don't make any assumptions as such on vertical sinking. It's, a, it's an outcome of our uh, observations. I just want to make that very clear. We do, uh, however, assume that there's no significant lateral motion between slabs. So we don't have slabs that, uh, let's say, sink in the mantle and get transported uh, laterally for thousands of kilometers. Also, and that is a bit of um, maybe a surprise. So, so the slab names that we've given are on the basis of the present day topography. And that we do that for the main reason is to separate interpretation uh, from observation. So for example, the Fairland slab, uh, as it is, was named previously, suggests it comes from Fairland oceanic crust. However, as we've seen from uh, recent papers, including uh, our convener uh, papers uh, here, uh, it, that might not be the case. So we've stuck as much as possible to where can we see the slabs and then in the future, interpretations of their origins might uh, change without uh, renaming those slabs every time, which uh, can be quite confusing. So in terms of the approach, we look at the various um, tomographic uh, depth slices. This is one at 1,600 kilometers. Uh, we've defined <coughs> midpoints for or centroids of uh, all these slabs. And then basically, for example, uh, at this depth, you see uh, these slabs here under India. Uh, so this is, I believe, the, uh, one of the Tatian slabs, and this is the Carlsberg Ridge uh, slab, and uh, are, are present there. And we compare between the P-wave model from uh, Utrecht and the S40 RTS <coughs> model um, from Jeroen Ritsma. So all in all, uh, we've interpreted 100 of these slabs that we could interpret in tom the tomography and could tie to the geology. There are more to, that we can see. 
However, the geological literature is simply lacking in some places, or is at least not accurate enough to give a significant date of the time of subduction. Just uh, another example of a deeper uh, depth slice uh, close to the core mantle boundary, this one. Uh, you can see also notable differences in, in amplitudes between the S-wave model and the P-wave model. Uh, and appearance of slabs changes uh, as well, obviously, to some extent. And uh, what comes out quite clearly, obviously, is the, 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 the African uh, low uh, shear wave velocity province that uh, hasn't been discussed yet, I believe, in, uh, in this meeting so far. And you also have another one, the, the, the perm uh, anomaly, as it's called. Uh, and what we have in between in the S-wave model here uh, is what we call the, the, the Balkan slab, which is a much smaller uh, feature here in the, uh, the P-wave model. And it seems that that one actually has been cutting the LLS LLSVP province in two different parts. So, which is quite a significant observation. Uh, we, we've seen something similar happening also in the, in, uh, the Pacific LLSVP, although at a bit shallower level. Right, so going to our, our methodology from going from young to old, if we take the Mediterranean as a test case, uh, subduction is obviously ongoing at present in the Hellenic uh, uh, trench. And uh, if you go further back in time, you have the subduction uh, happening uh, at the Alps, although that ceased uh, about 30 million years ago. Uh, if you go further back in time, then subduction happened in the, the, under the Balkans and or the Northern Torrides, and you go further back in time. So. Obviously, this area of the world has moved around uh, in, in latitude and longitude, but by systematically going from young to old, you can follow where, uh, what the ages of the slabs uh, underneath uh, uh, this area and also further south, um, and can correlate them. So this is one of the images from, um, uh, from the paper. So the Aegean slab, you can see the feature quite nicely dipping here, and it has also been shown uh, like that by uh, Saskia Goes, uh, amongst others. And uh, it's presently subducting. As you can see here, this is a north-south cross-section here going through the, the Aegean area, uh, dipping towards the north here. And where the top is obviously at the, at the surface, and the base is somewhere about here where, where it seems to be disconnected from this feature uh, down there. So from that, you can interpret, okay, so it's about 1,400 kilometers uh, deep, the base of it plus minus 100 kilometers, give or take. And you can argue about it uh, with all the tomographic models. You have slightly different interpretations. Uh, but uh, someone else can look at those uh, models as well. And in case the, the, the new approach would be using voting maps uh, for using different tomographic models, uh, on which a paper was published, I believe, last week. So looking at the Alps uh, slab, which is a, a, a subduction zone that ceased to exist, uh, about uh, 30 million years ago. So the slab itself is uh, stagnated uh, here, lying on top of the transition uh, zone. Uh, the base is uh, about 95 million years old, at, at its very oldest interpretation on the basis of the geological literature. Um, the top is about 30 million years, plus minus 10 million years. So again, you have a few data points defining how deep is it, how old is it, and top uh, as well. <coughs> Going back to what all, somewhat older geology, the feature I was pointing to earlier, disconnected from the Aegean slab, uh, is now called the East Varda slab, uh, which has been published recently as well. And uh, this already goes back to uh, Cretaceous to even Jurassic uh, ge geology. Uh, it's, this uh, was part of a, a more or less an interoceanic uh, arc uh, traveling through the, the proto Mediterranean at that time. If you go even deeper, then you have this feature here under the uh, Arabian Peninsula. Um, in the S-wave model, it actually connects with what we call the Balkan slab for the north. And uh, this you can tie back to the Triassic subduction that has happened uh, in, in the Mediterranean area as well. Obviously, when you go further back in time and, and deeper in the mantle, everything gets less certain. Uh, I'll admit to that. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, at the base of the mantle, 
most of the slabs you can easily correlate to, let's say, Triassic, to early Jurassic subduction. So you get um, these kind of interesting um, correlation diagrams. So following the route that I, I, I discussed previously, so you have the Aegean slab here, for example, sort of gives you an indication how old the East Farther slab must be in depth. Uh, and that also uh, points you to the Balkan slab and Al Jaf slab, uh, which are deeper and, and infer to be older. So uh, diagrams like this, we've done, uh, this is the one for the, the whole Tatian region. We've also done one for the, for the Americas. We've also done one for um, the Asia Pacific. So, and this, again, I, I'll point this out. So we've not done this lightly. We've consulted uh, 800 uh, papers uh, using uh, all the tomographic papers that were out there on any of these slabs, using all the geological papers, notably the art volcanism ones, to date all of these uh, slab remnants. And um, gives us uh, basically the atlas. So um, I, I don't have a movie for uh, 1.5 or 1.8 billion years here. I've got a movie of 13 seconds. Um, so if you could just point, uh, click it on. So just to give you an idea uh, of what uh, we've put in the, in the atlas, so they're all uh, nicely uh, lined up so you can uh, discuss them, can agree or disagree with interpretation. Um, but the key thing is this is the first overview of such a kind uh, that people can use to build their work on again. So there are more things that we can uh, get out of this data. One is uh, more age depth data for all these slabs. We can separate the data sets and you can see that the scatter is uh, basically largely inherited from what's happening in the upper mantle in the transition zone and after that it gets relatively unscattered, like except for a few outliers here or there. So I, I need to hurry up a bit, I see. But um, yeah, right. So you see these outliers. Some are fast uh, because of they are in a plume region, uh, so different viscosity possibly. Other ones might be slow because they are flat lying, like one of the slabs that Alex showed earlier. Um, if you go then further down in, into the sinking velocities, then you can actually see uh, a small kink here coming into place if you convert it to in situ uh, sinking velocities. Um, and that might actually be one of those lower mantle phase uh, changes that is happening, affecting the viscosity. <coughs> right, so coming to the conclusion slide. First global catalog that we can use. It will uh, appear online as well on the website, which will go live next week. Uh, we observe that all slabs sink to the, uh, through the, ma the mantle, so nothing gets stalled permanently anywhere. Um, everything uh, where we like to see subduction on the base of geology, we can correlate it back in the mantle. Uh, and likewise, no slabs uh, have disappeared uh, as, as, or have done weird things there. Uh, there's also a, a limitation, so we really can't find any slabs older than about 300 million years, and that's a stretch. Most the boundaries more or less 250 million years. That's the mantle record, and after that, everything gets slowly dissolved, it seems. Uh, so again, uh, next week, this website will go online. So the new uh, atlas, and uh, we welcome your comments there. Okay, thanks very much. I think it's appropriate to just launch right into our discussion. We have 15 minutes until lunch and um, we're a little bit over time, but it doesn't matter. So you can ask um, Dauwe directly and or the other authors. So can you be more explicit about what you mean by top age and bottom age? Yeah. Uh, are, are these the age of the lithosphere or are these the age at which they leave the surface? Very good question. Uh, no, it's simply the, the start and end of subduction. So it doesn't take into account what the age of the oceanic lithosphere might have been at the time. So it's just the start and end of subduction. Yeah. I have a quick follow-up on that. The example you showed under the Mediterranean was quite, you know, there was blue grading into blue into blue. So, and so you get brackets from the geologic literature. And so if they, if that bracket is, you know, or 
the duration in the geologic literature is very long, but your slab is very thin. Do you then just include the lower slab as well, or is it? Mm. I, I suppose uh, for the Aegean slab, uh, we're slowly refining it. Uh, so in the 2010 paper, for example, uh, I, I called it all as being Aegean slab, and that was maybe a thicker blob down there that I didn't fully understand. But uh, with the knowledge of the Mediterranean geology that we have now, we can identify different subduction phases and, in fact, opposite directions uh, as well. Uh, likewise, uh, in Americas, for example, the Fairland slab in the 90s was des described as basically one big feature. But uh, as your work has pointed out, actually there are different subduction events happening at various places along that continental or interoceanic uh, subduction zone. So we're now at the level that some of these prominent features, we can actually subdivide them. And we need to subdivide them because the geology requires us to subdivide it. Uh, Brian Barley, um, as a geophysicist, I, I kind of get hung up in these papers and critiquing the uh, velocity anomalies before I go on to mm. believing the interpretation. Um, your second bullet point on your summary, there, which says that uh, all slabs eventually percolate down into the, into the lower mantle, um, I could critically say uh, it's the same statement as you are able to find a patch of blue near the 660 kilometer discontinuity and below in all of the geological settings that you've examined <coughs> the subducted plates. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm, I'm hung up because I, I know that my boss, if I was presenting this in an exploration context, would say, right, convince me that that patch of blue there, rather than that one, yep. is this subducted zone. And that it is, in fact, a piece of subducted uh, lithosphere. I've been kind of waiting for someone to make this point uh, in the morning, and I'm not seeing it. Um, mm -hmm. do, is there a study which uh, addresses my, my worry? Well, it, it has been, uh, it's fair to say, there's been an ongoing debate since tomography was being used to image any of these anomalies. Uh, the, one of the key questions is always, be, well, what is it? And then at some point, yes, it fits uh, with subduction, at least uh, in Cenozoic times. And then we were going further and further back in time. So we're slowly, I would say, testing whether we can interpret, it, interpret all these anomalies as being uh, subducted slabs. And I can only say on the basis of our work and, and the tomographic model that we are using is yes, we all, everything which is uh, blue with an amplitude anomaly of uh, higher than 0.2% uh, in our model, uh, we can correlate that confidently to subduction. So we, we, where we have the geological literature, literature let's say the, across the Tatian region, we can find, uh, all, all the slabs we can find, we can correlate it back to the geology. All the geology that uh, tells us there must have been subduction in a certain area, we can tie to a, a blue blob, uh, so to say. So, can I be 100% confident that every blue block will be uh, a subducted uh, slab? No, I cannot. But so far, uh, as far as uh, we can test it, yes, it, everything uh, seems to be slab. So let's, um, let's also broaden the discussion. If someone has a question for Saskia and for Alex and um, let's see, Saskia, Alex and Mike. But you can ask Dover if you really want to. That's OK. <laughs> I'll ask a quick question of Saskia. With the correlation with the uh, shapes of the subducting slabs and the age of the oceanic lithosphere that's, that's coming into the system, uh, at least in some trenches, there is additionally a weakening irrespective of the age that's going on in the Ben region because of the faulting and, and so on. I realize this is a sort of secondary effect, but is there any, uh, any indication on your slab geometries of, of such a phenomena? What 
Um, actually, the weakening and the bending is quite important, and it happens in our models. So the models are able to actually partially yield in that bending region, because it makes the bending a lot easier. Bending a strong plate is actually very difficult. It takes a lot of energy. And Conrad and Hager, many years ago, they showed you can completely shut off plate tectonics, basically, mm -hmm. if you want all the slabs to bend to 90 degrees. And they assumed all slabs are very steep. If you look in the, in the dip angles, then many slabs are actually quite steep. So they said, well, let's fix that and let's see how much energy it takes. And it actually takes so much energy that it's easy to shut off subduction, unless you assume that it's weakened. So it's... Hi, I'm uh, Jean-Christophe robel davo I've got a question for Dewey. Um, you, you mentioned that after 2010, you, you managed to apply a, an 18-degree uh, correction based on, on the slab position. Uh, what about after the, the 100 uh, slabs compilation? What are the main um, plate technique corrections you would you'd be doing? So that's indeed an update that we now need to do. So um, if we have now a rich, much richer data set and also much more continuous all the way to uh, the present day subduction. And we've got more insights now in individual slab velocities as well, right? So, so I, I would say there's a, there's a natural evolution that we need to do an update of that. So uh, at the moment, as I, well, I was ru rushing through my slides there, but uh, you, there is an, a sinking variation happening overall. So it's definitely not the 12 millimeters a year anymore. Uh, and, and for every slab, we actually need to have a closer look. So th that's part of a planned update uh, at some point in time. Um, I have a question for Alex, actually. Um, we've, we found some seismological evidence that maybe the separation is also happening in plumes. So in some of the tomography from Jeroen Ritsema with, um, with uh, Ross McGuire, we analyzed some high-velocity anomalies inside the Samoa plume, for example, and show that this could potentially, you know, this could be fit with a hot guide separating below the 660. And also with um, Rob van der Hilst and Xiong Zhuang Yu, we've been looking at um, precursors as its precursors. And they also infer <coughs> density and velocity anomalies under parts of Hawaii. And there it seems that also you probably need some of the separation to explain the density and velocity uh, contrast. So. Uh, so, so I guess I, I do uh, agree. That, so actually, I saw the analysis for SS precursor. So in that case, uh, so in the area where it's uh, maybe a potentially hot, then I guess this is possible. So I guess one of the things I was trying to conclude in the end was if you look at most of the area where the closed lab going down, actually that's where the place uh, things are separated, and not just the place where near the common boundary, when it, whether it's hot, then uh, two components are separated. So I guess that's my uh, uh, the observation that we compile uh, in the end. Just say my name, Ben Van Veek from Clermont Ferrand. Uh, just one thing, thinking back to the old Holmes picture of mantle convection, Seeing all those slabs going down, uh, what is happening on the other side? Have, have, has anybody here looked at now, with all these slabs going down, they seem to be stagnating. C can you give us a view of, of the other side as well? Is Holmes convection wrong? Can you clarify what you mean by the other side? Well, like <laughs> Mid-ocean ridges and hotspots. We've seen everything going down, but Where's it coming up and how's it coming up? <laughs> it's probably the nature of a plate tectonic workshop that things go down. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I'm not a plume expert as such, but um, uh, what, uh, what is an interesting observation is that uh, one of the slabs lying at the core mantle boundary under the Central Atlantic uh, region, uh, called Atlantis, um, for that reason, um, has uh, a number of hotspots uh, on either side, basically the Canaries, Azores, 
Cape Verde and also uh, uh, on, on the Brazilian side. So on the Azores and the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, there are, let's say, from isotope to chemistry indications that you have recycled oceanic lithosphere in there. So uh, I cannot say it definitely has to come from that slab deep down, but it's very much a, a definite candidate that is being recycled actively at the moment. Maybe we can just quickly uh, add to that. I'm, I'm involved in a, in a large plume uh, imaging experiment, and I think it's fair to say that in the last decade, um, the view that's emerging from tomography is that these plumes are thicker than, than people thought. So they're more visible than you might expect from if they were just 300 kilometers in diameter. And sent that, that suggests that there might also just be more material flux coming through. <clears throat> but this is very much an em emerging view. Okay, I think maybe one more question if someone wants to round it off. Yeah. Uh, The leader on this is Brian Barley again. If you're if you're exploring for um, opportunities to uh, produce fractured hydroca hydrocarbons in fractured zones, one of the things you do often do is um, use anisotropy uh, in azimuthally rich uh, data sets to pick uh, to look for areas of uh, high curvature in, in the geology which have anisotropy, which is considered diagnostic and demonstrated as such by drilling frequently of uh, for open fracture for development of, uh, uh, of a field. It strikes me that with the, 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 the flexure of the, uh, of the plates uh, up in the near surface, that that, that zone uh, along the strike must be developing big time systems of fracture in a thickness of uh, many tens of kilometers. But I, I didn't hear any mention of anisotropy developed in that zone, yeah. quite the opposite. Could you no, I, I think that's, that's exactly the, um, the small amount of splitting that I, I, what I'm calling small is, is in that exactly the zone you're talking about. It's in the crust as it's starting to flex and all those fractures that are uh, going down. Because it, it, okay. it, it, it's in the direction of the flexure, so it makes a lot of sense. So a few tenths of a second of uh, yeah. splitting. Yeah, and I think going back to Peter's talk this morning, I think it's those, the fluids that are getting into those cracks those fractures as you get deeper that are causing the seismicity because it's reducing your mean effective um, normal stress. Okay, thank you very much. It always makes me a bit cynical about, about slab pull, having all of those fractures at the top of the system that's supposed to communicate a huge force up into the plate above it. Well, if I can just comment on that. So what happens in, in, in our types of models is that, yes, the top weakens of the slab and the bottom, but the core is still strong. So you can still propagate stresses through. You don't weaken it all the way through the plate. You just weaken the top and the bottom, basically, where you get the highest strains. 